Let's talk about customizing the web. The ability for users to customize the websites they use is something that empowers them to interact with the web on their own terms. And this is a big part of what makes a browser a user agent rather than say a television. Whenever a website fails to meet your needs, you can go, wait, I could do something about that. To better understand why this is so valuable, I asked people on Cohost, Mastodon, and Twitter how they like to customize the web, and the results were kind of surprising. I got over 70 responses, but only 11 of them said they made changes that were merely about personalization. The most common motivations were actually things like accessibility, readability, automation, and user rights. Other common motivations for customizing the web include fixing bugs and adding new features to websites and blocking content other than ads. I was aware of the ubiquity of ad blockers, but um, the fact that 18 responses mentioned needing to block other kinds of content was um, quite eye-opening for me. Taking a closer look at accessibility, um, a lot of the changes were um, related to visual needs like uh, dark modes and light modes, um, increasing or sometimes decreasing contrast, and removing distracting animations. Uh, but there were also other kinds of changes, things like uh, improvements to alt text, keyboard navigation, and compatibility with screen readers and other assistive technologies. Something I want to point out here, though, is um, how several of these kinds of changes have counterparts in the web platform now. So we have uh, features for authors now, um, like preferred, prefers color scheme, prefers reduced motion, forced colors mode, and the new focus visible selector. So I think the takeaway here that I, I really want to drive home is that um, as the builders of the web platform, we can learn from grassroots user customizations. There's a similar situation in uh, readability and layout changes, where like a lot of the common changes are things like overriding fonts and font settings, making layouts wider or narrower, and otherwise moving or changing layouts. But there are some parallels for this, for some of these changes in the web platform, with uh, built-in features now like reader modes and picture-in-picture -picture modes. Automation and user rights is probably the most diverse category of changes that I heard about. Um, this is really the domain of user scripts and bookmarklets, which I'll explain in a bit. But really, there's like a whole world of things you can achieve with those tools. Um, I heard about people um, uh, archiving uh, websites for like offline viewing, um, bypassing paywalls, um, automating data entry and responses improving navigation and disabling the kind of security theater that you'd get on like a bank website. So how do users achieve these things? Well, the tools that users have at their disposal kind of mirror the tools that authors have um, to build websites in the first place. So whereas authors might have styles, scripts, and interactive elements, Users can employ user styling, user scripting, and bookmarklets, uh, which are kind of a special case of user scripting. There are two main approaches to user styling. One is to set a custom user style sheet in um, Epiphany and Firefox, among others. This is a built-in feature that lets you set one global style sheet that applies to all pages. The, mo the more common option, though, is to install an extension that lets you write user styles, like Stylus. There's also Stylish historically, but I'd recommend steering clear of that because it was acquired by like a spyware vendor. Um, one of the major benefits of user styles is that you can have separate style sheets that apply to like specific domains or URLs, um, which makes it a lot easier to, to write targeted customizations. As for user scripting, um, the situation is quite similar. There's two approaches. One is to set a single global user script. This is a feature that's built into Epiphany. 
Um, and again, um, if you want to um, limit your code to certain websites or like specific URLs, you're going to have to write checks for those inside your user script. The more common option is to install an extension like Grease Monkey or Violent Monkey and write a user script. These extensions um, allow you to have separate scripts that target certain websites once again. Bookmarklets are kind of a special case of user scripting. Um, whereas user scripts run JavaScript on page load, bookmarklets run JavaScript when you click a bookmark. These bookmarks have the JavaScript URL scheme, but aside from that, they're not really special in any way. Bookmarklets also have some, some neat properties. Uh, for example, they count as a real user interaction, which is uh, useful for quite a few web APIs that are gated on user activation. So for example, if I had this date input and I wanted to um, uh, write a, like add a button to open the picker, for example, if I ran that code in DevTools, um, just got rid of that there, um, it works because there's a timer for user activation. But if I wait a few more seconds for that timer to expire, because um, I because I've interacted with the slides, um, you'll notice that it throws due to a lack of user activation. Um, whereas instead, if I drag this up to the bookmarks bar here and I go show, let's call it show, um, now we can show the picker no matter what. Uh, there is one major caveat to bookmarklets you've got to watch out for, and it's that you need to make sure that the, the last expression in your bookmarklet um, is undefined. Because if your last expression is not undefined, uh, that value will replace your page content. Essentially because it's equivalent to like a document.write call after page load. So with these two examples here, you've got um, a bookmarklet that tries to set a value in this date picker. But if I click it, um, it just replaces the entire page, which is not what we want. On the other hand, if I use the void operator to turn that expression into undefined, uh, it will work as we want. There's actually another special case worth mentioning now, and it's to do with user styling. Um, this special case is content blocking, um, specifically blocking content other than ads, which I assume you already have blocked. Um, but, oh, hang on a second. Um, there's uh, there's a bunch of nonsense here I'm going to have to get rid of. Um, I do have uBlock Origin, so let's let's give that a shot. Um, I'm going to right-click and block element, and I'm going to click to start with this. I really want to block the other ones, but I can't seem to pick them right now. Okay, I guess we'll start with this pop-up here. Um, it's suggesting a selector of .neg, uh, the fourth one. Um, I can drag this slider, it seems to go up to the parents. I'm not really sure if that's what I want, but, um, oh, okay, that's definitely not what I want. So I'll, I'll go to the settings and remove that rule, um, and reload, there we go. And let's try picking this pop-up here. We can use this slider, uh, to make the selector less specific, more general, um, and it looks like that did the trick. Now we've got all three bits of nagware highlighted. So I'm going to create the rule, and that's going to remove the elements from the page permanently. There is still this like overlay, though. Um, I wonder what we can do about that. Let's try blocking it now. But it's suggesting a selector of the third div, which is probably not what we want. Um, if I make it more general, it only suggests any div in the active slide, which is also not good, um, or just any div. So it's clear that the, um, the uBlock origin picker does have some limitations here. It really tries to focus on using class names where possible, and sometimes that just doesn't cut it. So I'm going to like open DevTools and have a look at this overlay here. And, oh, okay. I've made it intentionally difficult to target. Right, well, I guess, worst case, we can just match on this attribute and, and like, match only elements with this specific inline style. Um, that'll have to do. 
So I'll just block the element and change this selector here. And it still matches, and there we go. And we're all done. So yeah, you can use an ad blocker to block any kind of content, not just an ad. They work by removing elements permanently, and you can use the sliders in uBlock Origins Picker to select ancestors or make your selectors more general. Perhaps the most common use case for user styling is taking a text-heavy web page and making it more readable. Let's say we have the HTML spec here, and at the moment the text is a bit small for my liking, and the lines are too long. So what we can do is uh, start by breaking out of the frame here, and then I can write a user style for, let's say, all WhatWG specs. And looking in DevTools, we can see that the body is 80 ms wide. Um, I want to bring that down to, say, maybe like maybe like 45 or so ms. Um, we can do that in a user style by going body, max width, 45 ms. And while we're at it, let's, uh, let's choose a bigger and clearer font. So font are legible, there we go. And go back to the slides, and there we have it. The spec is a fair bit more readable. Another thing you can do with user styles is um, highlight and better surface existing information. So let's say I'm on Twitter and I see this really cool tweet by the Chrome account and I'm really excited about these features and I, and I want to retweet it, but I need to make sure I don't accidentally retweet it from the Servo account. So um, what we can do is perhaps h highlight some part of the UI to indicate that I'm on the Servo, servo account and need to be more careful. Um, so if we wanted to highlight the sidebar, we'd need to figure out um, what element to target. And immediately we run into a bit of a problem, which is that even if I go up here, up to the root of the sidebar, the CSS class names are completely inscrutable. This is, this is something that's becoming uh, more and more often a problem uh, due to like changing tastes in CSS practices. Um, there's a lot of things like components that generate scoped CSS or atomic CSS techniques like Tailwind. And these, these things, which are becoming increasingly common, um, uh, use a lot of class names that are either like randomly generated or hashed or, or otherwise presentational. Um, this like highlights another pretty big limitation of the current uBlock Origin Picker UI, which is that it's really centered around class names. So if you don't have useful class names, then you're kind of out of luck. So to get around this, I'm just going to use DevTools to pick this sidebar here. And let's have a look. That's a div, div, and ah, okay. Um, so the root of the sidebar is a header with role banner. So what we can do is create a user style for Twitter and say for any header with role banner, we want to set the background to red. And as you can see, um, the, the sidebar is red, but at the moment, the sidebar is red no matter what. So how are we gonna limit this to just the servo account? Unfortunately, if you're writing a user style, you can only target things that uh, can be expressed as a CSS selector. So you can't just look for text inside elements. So what else have we got? We've got an image here, which might have a source attribute. Um, we have some links down the side, which I mean, like there's like a bunch, like there's the profile link, which has the servo dev account name. So maybe that's the way to go. Let's just double check that it's actually a link. Um, there we go, into the parent, and it has an A with an href, there we go. So we can make this more specific by going has A with href servo dev. Um, at the moment, if you're using Firefox, um, you're gonna have to enable um, the has selector here um, until it ships next month. There are some other gotchas that you should watch out for while writing user styles. To understand them a bit better, we're going to take a look at GitHub and Garrett.
So let's say you're on GitHub and you wanted to make all of the text on GitHub yellow for some reason. Um, you could write a user style on GitHub and say star um, color is yellow. Um, and that'll make most of the text yellow, but you can still see some bits that aren't, like my username here, the, um, the tabs, and the issue number. Um, so for the tabs, uh, this is because although our user style shows up here, it's getting overridden because the, the styles on GitHub um, are just more specific. So to work around that, we can just add a dummy ID in a not, um, not selector here, and that fixes the tabs. But as for like the issue number here, the issue number has another problem, which is that the author styles use bang important. So to compete with that, uh, we're going to have to also make our rule important. And there we have it. Now all the text on GitHub is yellow. Unfortunately, that isn't enough for Garrett. So if we open Garrett and I do the same thing, even if I use the same workarounds as before and I go star not specificity and say color, let's say red, um, bang important. Um, you'll notice that the only text that's actually become red is the filter and these tooltips here. The rest of it is, is unchanged, which is a really poor result. This is because Garrett makes extensive use of Shadow DOM. They use Shadow Roots pretty much everywhere. And one of the things about the design of Shadow Roots is that you can't style elements inside those Shadow Roots from the outside. Unfortunately, there's no performant and robust workaround for this yet. The best you can do is write a user script that either walks down the shadow root tree um, or hooks attach shadow, depending on if the shadow roots are open or closed. Then inject your user styles with the adopted style sheets API. So let's install that uh, user script here. And now if I reload the page, all of the text on Garrett will be read. On the other hand, with user style sheets, the gotchas are quite different, and some of these are because of tooling limitations, whereas the others are due to how these two different approaches interact with the cascade differently. So on the tooling side of things, in Epiphany you might have more trouble targeting specific sites with your styles because it doesn't yet support the at moz document feature. Whereas with Firefox, although the feature is supported, you might have more frustration in general writing your user style sheets because uh, your styles will only get reloaded from the file when you restart the whole browser. As for the cascade side of things, most of the custom styles you find in the wild, say on user styles world, uh, would have been written for the author origin. So you're going to have to make quite a few modifications to them if you want to use them in a user style sheet. The differences between the author origin and the user origin are mainly twofold. For one, you'll almost always have to use bang important, and this is because of how the cascade works. One of the first things that we check is which origin the styles come from. Um, normally, author styles always beat user styles, whereas once you're using bang important, that relationship flips. And in bang important rules, um, user styles always beat author styles. On the flip side, um, one benefit of the user origin is that you will never need to use any specificity hacks. And this is because that origin check is where it all happens. And uh, the specificity, which comes afterwards, um, will never actually matter. And one other benefit of uh, the user origin for user styling is that you won't have any problems styling elements under shadow roots. So you won't have to write any user scripts or like monkey patch anything. And, and this, is, this is purely because, again, of the cascade. So if we tried the same two examples um, in Epiphany, which has user style sheets, 
on GitHub, we'll be able to write a rule that says star color red. And I won't be able to limit this to GitHub easily because of the lack of at Moz document. Um, but I will have live updates and a surprising amount of the text did become red, but uh, something that we're going to have to do a lot in um, user style sheets is use bang important. Um, but with just bang important, uh, everything is now red. Um, we're done. We don't need any specificity hacks. And even better, if we now go to Garrett, all of the text here is red as well. We didn't need to install any user scripts or do any like hooking or injecting of styles. Uh, the user style sheets work just fine with shadow roots. So I guess the next question is, how do you write a user script? Um, a user script is a normal JavaScript file, but uh, if you name it .user.js, it will be installable when you navigate to it. Um, there's also a like a metadata comment at the top that lets you set things like what URLs or domains to apply that script to, and what privileged features you should enable. There is one major difference though that you have to watch out for, and it's it's due to how um, extensions like Grease Monkey try and protect your user script from the potentially hostile page content. So to do that, um, Grease Monkey gives you a separate sandboxed window, like a separate global object. So if you want to interact with the globals in the page context itself, you actually have to use this unsafe window um, uh, global instead here's an example of a user script we can write. Over the last few years, there's been a real problem with like <sighs> fake GitHub scrapers showing up in Google search results. And they're really annoying because I like, I search for something that should just be a GitHub issue or a pull request or something. But instead I, all I get are like these results that are just GitHub, but worse. So to work around that, we can write a user script that uh, applies to those uh, bad URLs, and um, we can set up a little table of the different domains and um, how to turn those URLs into real GitHub URLs, because like some of them, they have like the issue number in a different place. And then uh, we can check if um, we are one of the bad URLs, which isn't strictly necessary, because I guess we have the match up there, but... Um, once we once we know that we're on one of these bad URLs, then we can um, we can like split up the URL and extract the user, the repo, and the issue number. Then we can generate a proper GitHub URL and redirect to that. So um, as for bookmarklets, um, one example that we could try is to make a button that goes to the next page in like a numbered series. Um, and we're going to try and make it generic. So like say I'm on XKCD or like I'm on um, a uh, GitHub issue, for example. Um, and in both cases, we want to like find a number and like bump it to the next one. So we can start by um, a we can start with a function which is quite useful because it allows us to avoid returning anything, which is quite important for bookmarklets. And if I ran that, um, we can see that we have uh, these path components. In this case, just one. Or for GitHub, we have servo, servo, pull, and the the like issue number. Um, the next thing we can do is uh, walk through those like path components, and if any of them is uh, just a just a number, then we'll bump that and um, update the location. So if we ran that, this should work fine in DevTools because it doesn't require user interaction. Um, but that should go to the next comic, and that should go to uh, the next issue. Um, so all we have to do now to turn it into a bookmarklet is uh, put everything on one line and put JavaScript colon at the start. So uh, if we call that next, uh, we should be able to hit next and go to the next comic.
um, and the next issue. There we go. So one thing you might want to do in your bookmarklets is copy some text to the clipboard. And while it is possible to do that, it is pretty cumbersome to do in the web API. So an easier approach might be to use the prompt function, which is a really old JavaScript feature that allows you to take user input synchronously. Um, we're not going to use it for that though. Um, we're going to take advantage of this second argument, which allows you to specify a default value. So if you click it, you get a pop-up um, where the text that you want to copy is highlighted. So the user can just copy that and click cancel or OK. The problem is, is no matter what you click, um, it will always replace the page content with something because prompt never returns undefined. So to fix that, um, what you need to do is go back to slide 22 and um, use the void operator. So if we, we have the void operator, then when we copy the text and we click cancel or OK, it doesn't replace the page contents. Now, I've been thinking about the current state of user customization on the web and the limitations of these techniques, and I came up with a few ideas for how we can help make these situations better. I think the biggest one, if there's nothing else you take away from this talk, is that we should take user customization into account and advocate for the user's interests when we're involved in spec design. This is actually one of the 12 ethical web principles uh, as defined by the W3C. People should be able to re render web content as they want. Other things we can do are to involve the devs of some of these tools in the standards bodies themselves. Um, like we could really benefit from their expertise and things like the shadow root situation may not be as painful now if we had listened to them earlier on. We can also help build some of that tooling directly, either existing ones like Stylus or Violent Monkey or new ones altogether. Some of the big areas for improvement, I think, are to um, create better UIs for picking and restyling elements um, this will make user styling more accessible to people who aren't as comfortable writing CSS. We could also improve support for user style sheets in the user origin. Um, they are oftentimes better than author origin styles, and uh, at the moment the tooling is a little bit painful. Um, we need the ability to um, target specific sites and um, live reload your changes. Um, and finally, we can also help uh, mon monetarily by raising funds for um, user script and user style repos. The big ones here are user styles world, greasy fork, and open user JS. So if you've come away from this feeling a bit more passionate about customizing the web, come work for Egalia, we can work together. Similarly, if you build tooling that helps users customize the web, maybe reach out to us because we can help make that a reality. Thanks a lot.